Man, it's good to be in God's house this morning. Thankful for all that God's helped us with. My good back there, Brother Jason. Um, you know, as I spent time with the Lord this week, um, he's he burdened, been burdening my heart about the people of God really purifying their lives, really taking church seriously, really committing to the Lord in a way like they never have. And what gets in the way of this is just everyday life, chores, busyness, babies, spit up, dogs. But can I tell you, none of that's an excuse to not really focus and purify your lives and be where you need to be in God's will. Although we like to use it as an excuse, none of it is an excuse. And uh, when, when the Lord led me to what he led me to this week, I'd like to tell you that I just, man, I just got it. I just understood it. I didn't understand. I had no idea what this passage meant. And when I read it, you're going to say, I have no idea where he's about to go with this. Just bear with me a little bit this morning because the Lord showed me something this week that I think will be a help to you that really helped me to examine my own life and my own self. And uh, don't examine yourself in light of what I tell you this morning, but look at what the Bible says to you this morning and see how you measure up, not with the pastor's expectation, but with the Bible's expectations. Because my expectations are not as high as what the Bible's expectations are for you. I heard no preacher say it this way. I don't always live up to my preaching, but I never bring my preaching down to my living. Amen. This, this, this is a bit higher than, than, than me. So if you have your Bibles this morning, and, and I believe that you do, if you turn over to the book of 2 Kings, chapter number 4, we're going to start in verse 38 about a passage that I have just... Never heard preached on before. I'm sure people have preached on it, but I've never heard it myself. Second Kings, chapter number four. We're going to look at a few verses this morning. When you find your place in Second Kings, if you'd stand your feet for honor and reverence to the reading of God's word. Some of y'all looking at your Bibles like the Second Kings ain't in there. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, if you, it, it's, it's between Chronicles and, uh, of course, First Kings. But before First Kings, we have uh, the book of Samuel. If you found your place in Second Kings chapter number 4, if you'd say amen for me. Amen. amen. All right. Verse number 38. Probably has something titled in your Bible, something like this. Elisha's Miracles for the Prophets or... Uh, if you have a Bible that separates your headings like that. Verse number 38, it says this. It says, And Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth in the land. And the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said unto his servant, Set on the great pot, and seize pottage for the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine, and gathered thereof wild gourds, his lap full, and came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. So they poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass, as they were eating of the pottage, that they cried out and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat thereof. But he said, Then bring meal. And he cast it into the pot, and he said, Pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. This morning I'm going to preach a message to you entitled this. There's death in the pot. There's death in the pot. Before I do, let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the sweet word of God. Lord, we pray you'd help us, Lord, as we look into your word, that we might, Lord, rightly divide it. God, that we might just be able to, Lord, be able to communicate to the people here this morning what you communicated to us. God, we sure thank you for the word of God, Lord. And anything's done in this service, Lord, if anybody's minds are enlightened or people can see, Lord, something they couldn't see before, God, I pray I wouldn't get any glory for it, God, because I, I can't do that. But God, I know the sweet spirit of God can do what I can't do and walk up and down the aisles and, and show people, Lord, what they need to do. 
Lord, according to your word, God, we pray you'd feed your people this morning. God, feed them good. Lord, we, we know they're hungry, God. We know they come hungry. I'm glad they did. God, we pray you'd bless them and touch them. God, we thank you for this. All in Jesus' name, church said. I mean, be seated. Thank you for standing. Now, I'm going to attempt to, in the next three hours, to show you what the Lord showed me in the Word of God right here this week that, that was a help to me, but in the beginning, I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to act like I, I'm some kind of uh, intellectual giant here. It, I struggled with what the Lord wants me to see in this passage, and I hope that I'm able to show you this morning. Now, the men that we see here in, in the Bible that gathered food, they wasn't trying to do anything wrong. They were hungry, and Elisha said, well, y'all go gather food if you're hungry. And uh, so that they, they went out and gathered some food for them to eat, and we see that there was something bad that happened when they went out to gather food. And uh, there's some spiritual application right here that, that the Lord showed me that I, that I hope will be of help to you this morning. And this is the first thing I want you to notice in verse number 38 and 39 this morning is this. The danger in famine. The danger in famine in verse number 38 and 39. It says, And Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth, that means a famine, in the land, and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him. And he said unto his servant, Set on the great pot, and seethe pottage for the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herbs, and found a wild vine, and gathered thereof wild doors his lap full, and came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. Danger in famine, well, what, what, what I mean danger in famine, can I tell you, when you're hungry this morning, you are more likely to make bad decisions. Y'all hear me this morning, when you're hungry, you're more likely to make bad decisions. I don't know how you work, but anybody in here ever gone on a diet before? Some of y'all, all y'all, y'all awake this morning, ain't you? All right, so uh, y'all ever gone on a diet before, and when you go on this diet that uh, you, you go out and for a while, everything's going all right. You're eating what you're supposed to eat. You're doing what you're supposed to do. You might be exercising and, and everything's going all right. You, you, your numbers are dropping. And, and, and I don't know if you're like me, but some days I get out and I get busy doing things and I'll get out away from the house. And, and I don't, we, don't, we eat out one day a week. We don't, we don't spend a whole lot of money in my household. We're just not that kind of people. Uh, we live broke too long. It just kind of got embedded in us that that's how we still live. If we have a dollar, we don't have a dollar. We don't like to spend money just... Uh, frivolously so what we do is we eat out one day a week and, and that's usually it uh, so sometimes I'll get out doing things during the day and, and it will be two or three o'clock and, and at two or three o'clock I'm not eating anything uh, so I come into the house and, and I've been gone from the house I'm starved to death and, and, and you could just about feed me anything at that moment and I would eat it because I get so hungry and I think to myself I'm going to get a hold of whatever I can get a hold of because I am starved to death I do the same thing traveling Traveling along, going along, thinking to myself, man, I, I'm very hungry. And, and, and you go and you go and you go and you finally get a hold of some food. You go into a place and uh, suddenly it's 10 o'clock at night and you're eating a Philly steak and cheese sandwich off a shelf at a gas station. And you think to yourself, man, I would never eat this, but I'm hungry. Y'all with me here? Danger in famine, okay? You may say, what's that got to do with me? Can I tell you, I find that when you are not feeding your soul on Scripture during the week, and when you're not praying during the week, when you're not seeking God during the week, and when you're not being with the people of God during the week, you will find yourself in spiritual famine. And the way that you are built as a human being is you will satisfy that hunger with something that you can get a hold of. Now, if you don't satisfy it with the Word of God, and you don't satisfy it with the people of God, and you don't satisfy it by praying, there will be something that you come into contact with as you go through your week, and that you will fill yourself up because you are too hungry for your own good. Now, let me tell you something, friend. If you come into church on Sunday and you not read your Bible during the week and you not pray during the week, you're wasting your time thinking I'm going to give you enough on Sunday morning to get you through what you need to get through during the week. 
I can't feed you enough. I know I'm the, I'm the under shepherd. I'm supposed to feed the sheep, but I can't feed a bunch of sheep who've not munched on the grass during the week and not munched on the clover during the week, who's not asked God to feed them during the week. And you come in here and you say, Preacher, I'm starved to death. Preacher, uh, please preach something that can enlighten my soul. And the preacher gets up here and preaches his gizzard out. And I believe you ought to preach when you get in here. That's why I preach red face with veins coming out of my head uh, because I believe it's important to feed the sheep of God. But can I tell you, if you come in here starved to death, I can't feed you enough amen amen this is church i know i'm preaching right now i know i'm preaching y'all bear with me a little while sometimes that's how you have to preach when you're a pastor amen amen can't all be can't all be evangelist preaching i used to be an evangelist you can't all be evangelist preaching sometimes you got to get a little bit of sheep preaching this sheep preaching y'all all right okay so here's here what we see is you hunger for something, you'll, get, you'll consume anything you can get your hands on. And here's the thing is, you might not have been trying to do anything wrong during the week. But you find yourself doing things that you shouldn't do. These men were not actively trying to sin, but can I tell you something? That what ends up getting you when you're starved to death is not a sin of commission. Commission meaning that you're not actively going out and saying, well, I'm going to just go tell a lie and I'm going to go commit adultery. And I'm, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to just do whatever I want to do and I'm going to, get, I'm going to get drug and I'm going to snort pills. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about sins of omission. Omission, not commission. Omission means things that you should normally do on a daily basis that you simply just don't do. Omission. That would be reading your Bible. That'd be praying. That'd be spending time with God. Uh, that would be fasting. That would be being with the people of God. That's the sins of omission. Uh, that as you go, you're not actively doing anything wrong. I'm not preaching to you saying, oh, well, I believe you're going out here during the week and trying to commit adultery and trying to do this and trying to do that. But it's when you go through the week and you go through your normal routine and suddenly you look up and you've not done the basics. It's omission. It's omission. And that's what ends up happening a lot of times when you find yourself starved to death. When you walk into church on Sunday, if you're not careful, what that ends up doing is souring your attitude about the house of God. Because when you don't feed your soul with scripture and you don't feed your soul uh, with praying and, and you don't do what you're supposed to do, uh, you'll come into church and you'll think to yourself, I didn't get anything out of that preaching this morning. I, I really didn't. I, I've not been fed in a while and I, I, I just don't know. Maybe I need to find a different church to go to and I don't know. I just don't, I don't like brother so-and-so too much. I don't like sister so-and-so too much. And I just don't understand what's going on with myself. And you come in here hungry to, and starved to death and hoping that this little bit of feed will give you what you need get through the week can't do it so you're going to constantly come to church you're going to constantly feel that way so we see feeding your soul with we, we know praying we, we, we know we know uh, we should be listening to preaching we know that we should be reading our bible but sometimes we just don't do it we should also be fellowshipping with the people of god we don't have a fellowship hall so everybody can tear out of here when it's time to, to, to have fellowship but you know what that does? You know why that fellowship's so important in a church? I'll give you a good example of that. She's not in here, but I'll give you a good example. I, I know Cassie, stay-at-home mom with three boys. I know that during the summertime, those three boys are home with her all day, every day, because Ronnie works an hour away from home. Is that right? So you're in church, and you hear Cassie get a little crossways with one of her boys and say, hey, Luke, sit down. And for long, you say, well, I don't know why Cassie's got an attitude like that. Every time she's in here, she's got a bad attitude. I hear her say some things. But when I start fellowshipping with her, eat a meal with her, talk to her, and I understand, well, Cassie's got three boys at home. She comes in here Sunday, probably pretty stressed out sometimes. And even if Ronnie helps, if Ronnie does the best he can, that only helps so much when you're not home. Right? So we come in stressed out, and when I hear Cassie get mad and say something, when I fellowship with her, I spent time with her, I can say, hey, guys, she got a hard life. She got a lot of things going on right now. It helps. When you talk and you realize, hey, we're all just broken people with our own set of problems, our own set of pain, our own set of circumstances, our own set of stress. And when you sit down with each other and you think, goodness, okay, I'm not going to be so ugly with them now. I get where they're coming from. I see where they're at. Guys, you can't get that like this on Sunday morning. 
Good to see you. I'm preaching this morning, ain't I? I'm preaching. You can't get it like this. Everything going all right, NJ? It's good, okay. You can't get it like that. It comes from, let me sit down and have a cup of coffee with you for 45 minutes. Let me talk to you about what you're doing. Let me talk to you about where you're at, what you're experiencing. That's what gives you staying power in the church. And when you get into church and you realize we all just broken, we're all just messed up. My family's in prison like your family's in prison. My family's on drugs like your family's on drugs. And my family's upside down like your family's upside down. But guess what? We just keep on keeping on together. We just get in here together. We do the work together. And we praise God together and realize we're all broken. We're all flawed. We're all doing the best that we can. And it gives you staying power in a church. Amen. Amen. So... Here we see they miss it. And what these men were gathering was a form of wild cucumber. It still grows near the Dead Sea. And when you cut it open, it dries rapidly and it forms a powder that's bitter to the taste. And if consumed in large quantities, it's very dangerous and it can induce colic and death. It's still used by some people as a cathartic medicine. You might know what the word cathartic means. It gives you a high. Now think about it just for a second. It gives you a high. Dangerous. But it gives you a high. You know, guys, that's exactly what sin is. It gives you a high. But boy, it's dangerous. It might be good in a second, but that cathartic experience... You know, we had a cathartic experience at Jubilee, didn't we? We were shouting and hollering and raising our hands, and, and God really met with us. That's a cathartic experience. And that's a good cathartic experience. But when you consume things that can kill you, just because in the moment uh, that they will give you a cathartic experience, you might say, what's that got to do with anything? What's the wages of sin? Death. It might give you a cathartic experience in the moment or some kind of high in the moment, but the end thereof is death. There's death in the pot, y'all. There's death in the pot. You know exactly how sin, when you have spiritual famine, you find yourself hungry, you get a hold of something that isn't God, it feels good in the moment. But the end of it, there's death in the pot. I can get some honest men in here. I'm talking about real honest. Now some of y'all, if you can't raise your hand, Ronnie, Ronnie, you're good, your wife's not in here. She'll watch it. Hey, Jason, just zoom over this way, away from Ronnie, so we can be honest for a minute. Any man in here like it when a lady flirts with him? Amen. Right? We all do. That's how men are, are built. Men flirt with mops if they could, especially teenage boys. They'll flirt with anything. That's how men are made. Doesn't make it okay, doesn't make, mean it's justified, but it, it, that's how men are made. Well, you, you go somewhere and, and a lady flirts with you and says, hey, you, you look good. Hey, you're looking pretty snazzy. Don't matter how ugly the woman is either, you don't care. She said something nice about you, you think, man, I still got it, I look good. Don't matter if she's ugly or pretty. Don't matter if she's ugly or prettier than the thing you got at home. It don't matter, does it, men? You like it in the moment. So she says something to you, and you think, yeah. And ladies, y'all like it too. Y'all like it when men flirt with you. I don't care if they're 8 to 80, blind, crippled, and crazy, you like it. <laughs> don't you? When somebody says, hey, you look good. Hey, hey, honey, that's a nice looking haircut. Why well, ain't you pretty? You like that. In the moment, it's a cathartic experience. And you're thinking, wow, I mean, I, I feel really good. I look really good. I, I, I don't know why my wife does it. See, that's what happened. There's where the death comes in. When you start thinking, I don't know why my wife, I don't know why my husband don't talk to me like that. Why well, they don't look at me and say, man, you look good. Because they have seen you vomit, and they have seen you diarrhea, and they have seen you hung over the toilet, and they have seen you in your worst state, and they have seen you with your breast stinking, and they have seen you with food on your face and on your lap. And why don't they tell you you look good every day? Because they have to live with your stinking tail. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's hard to get up and talk romance every single day of your life. You can't do it. And if you can, please see me after church and let me know what you do. But most of us can't. So when we get that, hey, you look good, we think, why don't my husband or wife? They, they, there's death in the pot, y'all. It might feel good in the moment. 
But what gets sowed into your mind and what gets sowed into your soul, the end thereof is not good for you. There's death in the pot. There's death in the pot. So we see that, first of all, the danger in famine. But let me show you number two, the danger in ignoring. Danger in ignoring, verse number 40. So they poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage. They cried out and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat thereof. Now it tells me that only one man of the ones that was eaten noticed something not right. Something not tasting the way it's supposed to taste. Y'all ever do that? You ever been invited to a church event? Go in and think, I can't put my finger on something's not right. I don't know, I don't know what it is, but something's not right. I remember my dad taking me to a church as a boy. And, and my, my dad wasn't trying to do anything knowingly wrong. Now, would I have made the decision he made? No, but that's part of being a parent. You hope, hope to learn from your parents. I hopefully Silas won't make the same mistakes I make as a dad. He took me to a Pentecostal church. And when I walked in as a kid, I remember feeling at that moment as a 10, 11-year-old thinking, something not right. I don't know. It feels weird in here. I don't like it. I don't know what it is, but it don't feel right. Well, they started hollering and screaming and rolling down the aisles and speaking in tongues. And uh, I thought, man, they really ain't something right. I don't know what's going on in this place. It scared me to death. I didn't know what was going on. There wasn't something right. I got, a, I got a taste of something that I thought. Now, am I saying that those people are headed to hell? No. But I knew it wasn't doctrinally right. Something wasn't, something wasn't lined up there. I believe there's going to be Pentecostals in heaven. Some people don't believe that. I believe that. It's, it's, a, it's a doctrine issue, not a salvation issue. So we see here, something wasn't quite right. So I, when that guy started eating, I thought, probably shouldn't be eating this. Probably shouldn't be doing this. Holy Spirit will tell you that if you listen to it. Listen to him. When he says something to you, Holy Spirit comes up and says something to you, whispering in the ear. When you get around somebody and something perks up and you think, that person ain't right. Part of the thing Brother Chip talked about in security team meeting was when somebody ain't quite right, you need to be suspicious, follow, like look, see what's going on. God gives you that discernment. When something's not right, believe what the Spirit says and say, ah, I don't know about that. I can't quite put my finger on it. Don't know quite what's going on, but I'm going to tell you this. Don't want it anywhere near it. Don't want it near me. Don't want it near the church. I won't go into the details, but something come up. Me and Ronnie talked about yesterday. A person that we talked about, hey, what if they come to the church? I told Brother Ronnie, I said, don't want them here. Don't want them here. Don't want them here. Don't want their spouse here. You know what Ronnie said? Oh, preacher, I don't know why you say it. No, he said, sounds good, preacher. You, you know more than I know about that. I'm going to just trust you. By the way, that's what it should be. When, when, the, when the preacher stands up and the, and the word of God says, I'm supposed to watch for your soul, and the preacher sees something, and he tries to tell you, and he's preaching his heart out about what, something like I'm preaching out right now, uh, don't walk out of here and, and think, oh, I don't know. I'm not going to do it. Guys, my job is to watch for your souls. And being that, the Lord knows what you need, and he speaks through me, and I might not even know what I'm preaching about sometimes. I'm just telling you what God told me. But the Spirit of God walks by and says, hey, that's exactly what I've been trying to get you to notice this week. When that Holy Spirit touches you, touches that sore spot, and he lets you know, hey, there's something off there. And can I tell you, I've, I've learned something through the years. When your pastor says, be careful, you better be careful. Not because I'm some superhuman person, have superhuman wisdom, but there is a man that I know that I serve, a God in heaven that has superhuman wisdom. And when he gives that sense to the pastor and says, watch out, you better watch out. You better watch out. Danger in ignoring. And I'm going to just use a country boy example for a second. Y'all, let me hear. Y'all know what this is? Splitting wedge. What do you do with splitting wedge? Split wood. I split in wood this week. Sometimes you hit a splitting wedge. I'm going to just tell you how Satan works on you. We've talked about church unity. I'm talking about unity in your spirit right now. 
Sometimes I'll get a piece of wood. I saw up a tree for, for I call it firewood. Y'all might call it firewood. Sometimes I'll rear, I'll rear back with that, with that splitting maul, and I'll say, bam! Buddy, and that log won't budge. I mean, it's just like a cartoon character. You know, when you hit the, the anvil and it rattles back, and you think, man, alive. But I find no, how, no matter how hard any log's been, I can take this thing right here, tap it in with my sledgehammer, and I can hit it a few licks, and it will split every which direction. I don't care how hard it is. I had a, I had a log a few, uh, last year, I think it was. It wore out a chain, my chainsaw chain. I mean, it smoked and sparked and everything. I mean, it was harder than lead. I drove this through it, and it split. Didn't want to split, but it split because it's pointed, and it's heavy. And even if you have to, you can drive that in and leave it for a day or two, and it'll work on that wood. Can I tell you, when you have gaps in your spiritual life, that's exactly how Satan works. He walks up with that wedge, that pointed wedge, and even if he can drive it that far, even if he can drive just the tip of it, he leaves it long enough, it'll start to create a gap, start to create a split. And I know when that, when that log, I couldn't get the split, and I drove that in the other day, the, Lord, the Spirit of the Lord was working on me when I was doing that, and I, I was about to have a time out there just hammering uh, this in there because the Lord started working on me. And, and when, when I split that, that the first time, and I hit it the next time with, the, with that log, guess what? It went every direction. Because once I got it split, oh, I could destroy it. That's how Satan wants to do. Once he can get that in there just a little bit. And I, like I said, now I'm telling you, you might not think fellowship's important, but the Lord does. You might not think reading your Bible should take priority, but the Lord does. And when Satan sees that gap, he'll drive that in there. He'll leave it for a year if he has to. And then the next time, he'll hit it again. He'll hit it again. And before long, you're going every direction. They ain't nobody ever, there, there, there is Christians that are addicted to crack this morning. Do y'all believe that? I'm talking about born again Christians. How did that happen? That little bit was in there and he just kept being drove, driven until before long, crack, split. That right there don't seem that destructive in the moment. But man, it'll do, it'll do something. It will do something. It will tear some stuff up. Just that little point with a little bit of heaviness, and that's how the devil works. He has that little point, but then it has heaviness that that just weighs. And as it weighs, that gravity pulls that in, and before long, there you are. Ain't nobody ever got up on, on Monday morning and said, I'm going to be the biggest crack addict in the world. I'm going to be the biggest harlot and wise. Do you think that happens? Nobody gets up and says that, but it happens by that. Just that little bit of split. Now you can rationalize the way and say there ain't nothing wrong with this. Well, preacher, you don't understand. Th this, this song that I like to listen to, this group I like to listen to, uh, th they're not that bad. If they aren't pro-God, what are they? They're anti-God. That's right. I'm talking about CCR. I know it sounds good to listen to on the radio. I'm talking about the Beatles. I'm talking about, I heard preachers say this way, and I, well, this way, and I tend to agree. They ain't a secular group out there that's not a fornicating, drinking, uh, dope dealing, dope taking harlot of some kind. That's just the fact, y'all. Not your group. Yeah, your group. They're all like that. You show me one that's not. You show me one, I, 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 I ask you, show me one that you, that you feel like it's all pro-God doing what they're supposed to do. Now I'm preaching to me too this morning. I grew up listening to that kind of stuff. You think that CCR, I turn that on, I hear, uh, what is it, Green River, don't, don't do something for me. I think, man, that sounds good. It's cathartic, but there's death in the pot. There's death in the pot. You say, well, how, how does something like that, like, let, me, let me ask you this. What if, what if I, at my house, what if at my house, first of all, I'm preaching, I'm preaching purity, I'm preaching the gospel, I'm preaching living right, and Silas, when he, he said, well, well daddy leaves, leaves church, he's preaching about all this, when we get home, he's listening to Hank Williams, he's listening to Travis Tritt. I don't understand, that something ain't lining up here. Why does he preach against it and do something different at home? Then he starts listening to it himself. So he said, man, I like country music. So I'm going I'm to go to myself a concert. He goes to the concert. He walks in there. 
What happens to country music concerts? Well, I can report it to you. I've been to, to a half dozen of them. I know exactly what happens. There's people vomiting because they're so drunk. There's people fighting because they're drunk. There's people snorting, snorting pills. There's people taking dope. Uh, there's people passed out. There's people that's on this. There's people that's on that. Uh, there's, there's adultery happening. There's fornication happening. Uh, what goes on? I can tell you what goes on. What if I get him interested in that and he goes to that? Then guess what? Satan just found a weak spot in his life. And all he's got to do is crack. I'll drive that there a while. For long. See, Satan's, remember I told you about Satan. His idea is not to inconvenience you. It's to take your children from you. And if he can do that, it might start out by a country music song. And it might end up with him strung out laying in the back of a truck somewhere because he took the wrong thing or somebody spiked something that he was drinking. Or you could just say, no, son, we don't do that. We don't listen to that. We don't go there. We don't, we don't talk that way. We don't, listen that, we don't listen to that stuff. There's danger in the pot. There's death in the pot. There's danger in ignoring. Number three, I, I'm coming to close here in a few minutes. There's deliverance in the flyer. I'm glad I can say flyer here and everybody knows what I'm talking about. I said that in Kentucky and they didn't know if I was talking about flyers, flyer or flyer. Road flyer, flyers, you give them Mother's Day or flyer that you cook with, they didn't know what was what. But I tried to tell them there's a difference in flyer, flyer, and flyer. And he's like, I don't, I'm not hearing it. I said, well, there is. Deliverance in the flyer. Flower, if I say flower in your Bible, is a symbol of truth, which is from God. Notice number, verse 41, deliverance in the flower. And he said, then bring meal. And he cast it into the pot and said... Pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. Now there was just death in the pot. But now there's no harm in the pot. Somebody said like this. You've been trying to find pleasure in the world. You've found wild vines. You've gathered wild gourds. A lap full. Almost a heart full. You've been shredding death into the pot. And now you cannot feel as you used to feel. Ever been there? I have. The poison is stupefying your soul. While we were singing just now, you said, I want to sing as the saints do, but there's no praise in me. If you're a worldling and not God's child, you can live on that which would poison a Christian. Oh, listen to this part. But if you're a child of God, you will cry out, Oh, thou man of God, there is death in the pot. There's death in the pot. And I noticed that Elisha didn't try to get the gourds out. Friend, we can't rid the world of sin. He didn't go out on a mission and say, I'm going to get all the gourds out of the pot. Guys, we can elect Donald Trump. There's still going to be gourds in the pot. There's still going to be death in the pot. We can elect Biden. There's still going to be death in the pot. There's always going to be death in that pot that's made of the world. But we can be flour in the midst of the gourds. When Elisha put the good stuff in the bad stuff, the bad stuff was neutralized. The good stuff won out. You can't rid your whole family of the gourds, but you can be flyer in the pot. There's death in the pot. You can be flyer in the pot. You know what flyer in the pot looks like? No, we don't do that. We don't go that way. Oh, you want to do that on Sunday? Sorry, we don't do that on Sunday. We don't do it. We go to church on Sunday. You're going to stay in my house, you're going to go to church with me. If you don't want to go to church with me, you're not going to stay in my house. What am I being? I'm being flyer when there's death in the pot. I'm being flyer to my family to show, hey, you know what? I'm not perfect, but guess what? I'm going to do my dead level best to live the way I'm supposed to do, to do what I'm supposed to do, to act what I'm supposed to act like, to listen to what I'm supposed to listen to, to watch what I'm supposed to watch. Why? Because there's death in the pot and the stakes are too high. For me not to sit back and say, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to offend anybody. You know what? You just live your life like that, your little sissified life, and saying, I'm not ever going to offend anybody. You're still going to offend somebody. Somebody's going to get mad at you. Like I said before, y'all might not like what I preach, but y'all ain't never going to walk out here and say, I have no idea where he stands. No idea what he meant. I don't know how a preacher feels about country music. <laughs> I don't know how a preacher feels about drinking. <laughs> I don't know how a preacher feels about being a sodomite. <laughs> Y'all ever said that? No. Why? Because you need to be flyer. 
You need to be truth from the Word of God, not your own truth, not your own opinions. Now, there's some people mask their, their opinions and try to act like they're being, well, you know what, I just tell people the truth. No, you're a jerk face. There's a difference in being truthful and being a jerk face. <laughs> right? I can tell you what the Bible says, but I don't need to tell you you look fat when you walk through the door. That's not honest. That's opinionated. There ain't nothing in the Bible that I can take and say, hey, I want to show you something. The Bible says you ought not glutton. We say the Bible says you ought not gossip. But you do, right? We all, we all have something that we're, that we're guilty of. But you can be the flyer in a world where there's death in the pot. Man, there's life in that flower. Miss Becky, will you come and help me this morning? I'm coming to a close here in just a minute. I figure as I look in the Word of God this morning, I figure you're one of two people in this story. One of two people. You might be the person here in the Word of God to where when you look at your life, you think, man, I've been consuming death out of the pot. Not even really realized it. And when I looked up and, and what you said, what the Word of God said, how the Spirit of God got with me, preacher, I need to tighten up on what I'm listening to. I need to tighten up on what I'm watching. I need to tighten up on what I'm doing. Or you might just be simply a sin of omission. You're not reading your Bible like you're supposed to. You're not praying. And what happens is you feel yourself starting to slip. You don't mean to. You don't want to. But guys, there's death in the pot. That small slip, that man, I forgot Monday to read my Bible. You might think that that's not that big a deal, but it's a big deal. It's a big deal because of the gap that can be created in your life. And as soon as Satan finds that gap, man, he goes in. When you look at the whole armor of God, you know there's nothing, Brother Eric, to go on your back because you're not supposed to run. You're supposed to fight, but you can only fight to keep the sword of the Spirit, that breastplate of righteousness that helmet of salvation. I mean, you've got to have it all, all the time. You're in warfare, y'all. You're in warfare. This is, not, this is not even the ultimate fighting championship. You're in war. You're in medieval war. I'm talking about guts and gore. Somebody wants to kill you. There's death in the pot. So that might be you, but then I figure you might also maybe just feel like in your family you see the darkness, you see the trauma, you see the sin, and maybe you've admittedly struggled to be that flyer in your family to be the meal but maybe you want to say God I'm, please help me to have a backbone like a saw log and say I'm going to, this is what I stand for you can like it, you can not like it this, this is where I'm at one thing I figured out already parents and many of y'all been doing it way longer than I have your mom and dad ain't going to agree with every decision you make as a mom or dad but you know what you just stand Say, I'm not moving. I'm standing where I stand. I'm standing on the Word of God. I'm going to be flyer. You might not agree with it. You might not like it, but I'm going to stand here. And if everybody else gets mad at me, I'm going to do it what God, the way God told me to. I'll say this. I'll come to a close. Guys, I don't know what new age parenting does. I don't know what new age Christianity does but I know what the old way does I know what the kind of people it produces it produces Jared Dixon's and Jason Holly's it produces Haynes Baptist Singers the Bible says find you the old way and walk therein stand on it stand on it if you stand your feet this morning every head bowed and every eyes closed I don't know how the Word of God worked on you this morning. But I ask you this morning if the Lord convicted you over something, not, don't matter what it is, maybe you just come and tell God about it and say, God, please help me. Lord, you pointed something out to me. Lord, I didn't realize that I was teetering into death. God, I didn't realize that what I was doing was as dangerous as it was. And the Lord came by and said, hey, you're doing a good job, but don't neglect any." Not even a little bit. Keep it all. Keep it all strong. If that's you this morning, won't you just come tell God about it?
Say, God, I see there's death in the pot. Help me to stay strong. God, help me to be flyer in my family. Help me to stand firmly on the word of God. Help me to have a backbone like a saw log. Maybe husband, wife, maybe just lock hands with each other and say, help us. Help us not to put, make sure there's no death in the pot when we raise our child and what we do in our home. Help it to be pure. God, help us to be strong. God, help us to make sure nothing slips. I know it's hard, parents. I know it's hard to get up every day and read your Bible and listen to preaching and spend time in prayer. I know it is. I'm there. But don't neglect not even one of it, not even a bit of it. Maybe just come and say, God, help us. God, help us, Lord, to be what we should be for you. There's people getting help. There's more people that need it. Would you come this morning? Would you come this morning? Would you please come? Maybe somebody in the house got something on their heart. You'd like me to pray about it. You slip that hand up and right back down. See that hand. Anybody else? Up and right back down. Say, pray for me. See that hand. Anybody else? See that hand. Anyone else? Up and right back down. Our Heavenly Father, God, we sure thank you for your word. God, we thank you for this message that you laid on our hearts. God, we pray you bless the people that are here this morning, the people that came forward and the hands that were raised. Lord, the people that, Lord, are, maybe still be in their seats, Lord, that you, Lord, know what they need. God, we pray you touch them and help them, Lord, and encourage them. God, we pray you bless this simple message from the word of God. Lord, we know, Lord, that I have nothing to offer anybody in here, Lord, but I pray that they would just, Lord, get with the word of God. Lord, let it be a lamp for them. Let it be a light for them, Lord. Let it be a mirror for them. Lord, and not try to live up to my expectations, but live up to what the Bible says. And God, we ask this all in Jesus' name.